Welcome to Radio Maria, and I have with me Father Michael Leitner, a very special priest with a very special story, and I'm going to ask him to tell you his story of conversion because he came to the priesthood uh, kicking and screaming, I would say, at first, and I know about his story because he's the first one in a book I wrote called Of Men and Mary, How Six Men Won the Greatest Battle of Their Lives. And I'm very, very grateful to him for sharing this story with me and with the world and excited to be able to share with you him telling it in the first person. And thank you, Father, for being on the show. No problem. It's a pleasure to be here with you. Well, I I grew up in a family, um, we had 11 pregnancies in our family. There was four died in miscarriage and one after birth. So I was the youngest of six kids and we were spoon fed our Catholicism. Um, My mom was a very religious person. She did uh, trips to Medjugorje, over 94 trips. Um, Only only 94, huh? Only 94. Only 94. Um, So when I fell kind of wayward in college. She kind of picked up the slack and she basically said, you're going to Medjugorje. And so I agreed. I went with her one Christmas. It was 1993, 94 would have been, um, or 94, 95. I'm sorry. And I didn't really want to go, but I went with her to appease her. And she asked me one thing. She said, if you can't do anything else on this trip, I ask you to to actually go to confession. And she said, if you do that, the trip is yours. So as a college student, I'm like, okay, the trip is mine. I'll go do this, you know, I'll I'll work the deal. So I stood in a line of confession and there was only one confessional open with an English speaker. And um, so I was in line and I was praying and I was like, well, if I'm gonna do this, I'm gonna do it right. I'm gonna give him everything. So I went in and I unloaded on this priest and in the midst of that, I, I imaged this 90-year-old priest with blood running down his face, right? I mean, that's what I had in my head. And it was far from the truth. Um, but during the confession, I had an experience which changed my life forever. I was kind of forced down back into a kind of a hurdler's stretch like this, so my legs and my torso and with my knees underneath me and I couldn't move I was I was kind of struggling and I was a big guy and I lifted a lot of weight and you know I was on my way to you know bigger and better things in football I hope and um, what happened is during the words of absolution I felt something kind of pierce my outer skin and move into my chest and into my heart and it it was a it hurt at the moment, and then it was pulled out, and something was released. It was all that anger, all that resentment, all the stuff of the world that we get, the anxiety, the fear, all of those negative emotions released at that moment. And when I was coming up, he was done with the words of absolution. My body came up like this, and my first thought was, oh, my God, he's real. And that concept that God had that connection, that intimate of a connection with me, scared me. Hmm. Why, why did it scare you? I knew I was forgiven, but I knew that my life, my life um, that I lived, I would have went to hell Oh. at that point. If I would have been judged at that moment outside of the confessional, if I would have died, more likely than not, I wouldn't have... Um, had a chance at eternal life. I kind of knew that in my spirit. Oh. And, can, uh, can you tell the listeners what your life had been like to merit hell? Mm-hmm. Well, I was playing Division One football at Eastern Michigan University. There was a lot of drinking, a lot of drugs, a lot of um, dating women. Um, just a lot of college stuff that college kids do. They get in trouble and they lose kind of their way. I'd stop praying. I'd stop going to mass. Mm. The only thing religious that I, I held on to was the brown scapula. Oh. 
wore that through college, but yet I was doing some awful things in that sense. And um, so this is why mom brought me to Medjugorje. She kind of figured all this out. And so I'm in Medjugorje. This happens. I come out of the confessional, and I'm a different person in the same skin. And I'm just kind of, it was like a car accident running through my mind. And it just kept on coming to my mind, and I couldn't get it out. And I'm sitting in the choir loft for Mass at St. James Church in Medjugorje. But all of a sudden, it's broken by this priest walking up to the pulpit with a guitar. And he starts playing his guitar and singing. And I said, Lord, this guy's pretty cool. Let me open my heart to hear what he has to say. And I had another experience 30 minutes after the first. And that I know as Pentecost. Mm. In the research that I've done and the feelings I've had and the manifestation of the gifts of the Spirit afterwards, I was flying high. I mean, I literally thought I was on the ceiling. I thought I was doing the Joseph Cupertino thing and flying around, right? Oh, wow. That's the feeling of my mind, my heart, my spirit at that particular time. Huh. And uh, the guy's name was Father Stan Fortuna. Um, he's become a good friend of our, mine, and, and I've, uh, I've spoken with him at a lot of conferences since then. But uh, what a great message he had, and it just lifted my spirit, and the Spirit of God just entered me at that point. So I was walking outside, and uh, I was with an Italian-American kid who knew Italian because his grandparents spoke it. And this woman comes up to me, and she goes, Benedictio, Benedictio, Benedictio. And I didn't know what that meant. I, I asked Ryan, I said, what is that? And he said, well, she, she's asking for a blessing. So I said, well, I've seen Betty Hinn. I can do that, you know. So I grabbed her melon and this, <laughs> this prayer came out. And it was uh, St. Michael the Archangel, defend us in battle, pierce her heart, fill it with love, joy, and peace, and take away the temptations, torments, and trials of the devil away from her. And immediately I felt the Holy Spirit, now I know as the Holy Spirit, come through my hand. And all of a sudden she was lying down on the deck. She fell in the spirit. And I'm a 20-year-old football player. You know, what do I know? And I looked at Ryan and I said, let's get the hell out of here. Because I didn't, I didn't know what happened. She had a stroke, I mean, seizure, you know. Um, and those so beautiful words just came out of your mouth unpremeditated, that prayer? Yeah total Holy Spirit. And it was a very, very powerful thing. But, you know, after that, it was the miracle of the sun that I saw 20 minutes later. I witnessed a deliverance, you know, at the hands of priests. I, this was all on the first day of Medjugorje. And I was like, holy crap, my mom was right. You know, because we thought she was out there, you know. And this place was like Catholic Disneyland. It was like everything that you've been taught, and it, it started to make sense, you know, from the encyclicals that, you know, I've read in the seminary to scripture to all of that started making sense. It started making the connections in my mind and my heart. Do you remember and specifically whole, what was making sense to you? Well, that, in a sense, God is hidden in plain sight yeah. he is always there he doesn't always act in miracles like that but he respects our free will to such um, a level that you know if we don't strive for that it's not going to happen right? mm -hmm. and I think it's where the church is at too you know the people in the church aren't striving to have an apostolic you know, moment like that where the gifts of the apostles are laid bare by God. And I think it's a loss of the mystical within the church. Does that make so sense? Is your answer in your statement in that are you saying if the faithful would strive for this, if they would seek to have the gifts, if they would believe in the gifts, that they would become manifest? There's no doubt about it. There's things that we can do, the how, the things that we can do to help that manifest. We can go to confession. We can pray the rosary. We can fast and do reparation on this 
anniversary of Fatima that we're filming this. Yeah. We can, you know, we can read scripture, even a verse a day, right? Yeah. And, you know, and to receive Holy Eucharist as much as we can. Those are the five things that Medjugorje teaches. And that is a preparation of the renewal of the mind that St. Paul talks about. Right, those connections being made for me in Medjugorje at that time as a 20-year-old was the renewal of my mind. God was taking the scales off my eyes to see that he really existed and he was present to his people, especially those that were asking for his faith. So you have this enormous grace right after confession. Your sins are pulled out of you. Then you're brought into a moment of ecstasy, not, what, 20 minutes later. Then a few minutes after that, you are given words by the Holy Spirit to pray over a woman. She's slain in the Spirit. You have no idea what you've just done to this poor woman. You want to get the heck out of there. And then what? What happened to you? What did you do with yourself? Well, I think that, you know, Ultimately, you know, we spent 10 days there, and that was the first day. Oh, my I mean, gosh. I, I, oh, my gosh. I could, I could write a book. I could write a book on each of the 30 trips that I took to Medjugorje, right? I mean, the miracles in people's lives, the changing of people's hearts, the, the aspect of people receiving their faith in an unfiltered way for the first time. It was very, very, very powerful. So my... my about four or five months, four months later, I think it was in um, March, my mom called me at college and she asked me to go again. And I, absolutely, I said, yes, I want to go. So in June, over the anniversary, we ended up going to Medjugorje. This was in 19, I think, 95. And um, at that time, I, I received a call to the priesthood. And I was at a place called Soroki Bridge which is the Franciscan monastery in the province of Bosnia, Herzegovina. And this is where the 19 seminarians, 19 Franciscans died at the hands of the Nazis in World War II. There's martyrs laid on the ground, right? So what the church says is it said that the faith is built on the blood of martyrs, right? So in this chapel, Father Yozo, who was the original pastor of Medjugorje when the vision started, was laying hands on all the priests. And all the priests were laying hands on all the people. And I, I swear to you, it looked like a, a, a Benny Hinn show. I mean, 90% of the people that were there, the faithful, were on the ground slain in the Holy Spirit. And great healings were happening. I mean, people were, were walking, people that couldn't walk before, wine were being healed. Um, huge interior conversions happening if i could interject we went there when my son was just three years old and i don't if you think about a three-year-old who just had a popsicle and how they act hyper just running around running around the church we had to take him outside he comes in one of these priests whom you speak of lays his hands on my son i think actually it was father yozo himself my little three-year-old sits down with a rosary and starts kissing the crucifix, saying, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Yeah. Oh. I mean, it, it, it's such a dynamic thing that, that you see for the first time in your life. So anyway, I'm, I'm following this one priest in particular, reminded me of Padre Pio, who's the Franciscan. And he was laying out people left and right. And I was catching them from behind. I'm a big guy. I was kind of getting my workout in, right? And uh, he comes to this woman in a wheelchair who her husband comes to me because I'm with the priest. He tells me my wife has um, spinal meningitis, but her spinal cord was separated seven years ago. And spinal meningitis deteriorated the bottom half of her spinal cord. And she had atrophy in her leg so bad that literally they're about the size of my wrist. And um, he's praying over her knees and her ankles and her hips and the whole deal. And he's going on for 15, 20 minutes. Well, I'm looking for something to do because I'm bored, right? She's got a separated spinal cord. She doesn't have a spinal cord from here down. She's a paraplegic. And there's no way that she's going to get up and walk. 
right? So I'm sitting there, I'm looking for something to do, and my attention's brought to the woman, and I know it's God doing it. I can feel it, and I go, what? You know, what do you want from me? She's not going to want. And he says, if I get her out of the wheelchair, will you enter the seminary? Immediately, I was like, no. Uh-uh. No, I, I, I got plans. <laughs> seminary, you're talking about preschool, and this conversation's happening between me and him. And I'm going over, you know, the things in my life. I want to get married. I want to have kids. And this whole thing's kind of going through my head. And at the end, I hear the Holy Spirit whisper, but it would be pretty cool to see her walk, wouldn't it? Oh. All right. I said, I changed the deal on him. I said, if, Lord, show us your power. If you get her up out of that wheelchair and walk her around this entire church, and it's huge. I said, I'll know it's you and I'll go in the seminary. Within five seconds, she was up on her feet. And she started pushing her wheelchair around the corner, and, and I was like, why is she taking a lap? You know, nobody knows that. She turns the second corner, and I'm looking for somebody to trip her. You know, I'm just, <laughs> a linebacker here, right? And uh, she turns the third corner and the fifth corner, and or the fourth corner, and I changed the deal again. I said, if she doesn't you know, step on that slate block in the middle of the floor. I said, I'm not going. Well, she stepped on it with one foot and then the second foot, and they pulled the wheelchair around and sat her in the wheelchair again and wheeled her off. And I was mad. I felt like I was duped, like I was tricked, right? So I said some choice words to the Lord, and I walked out, you know? And um, it was it was a long road. It was two more years of me discerning. So in 1996, my mom asked me if I wanted to go to Batania, Venezuela. And I said, well, what's there? And she told me about this mystic called Maria Esperanza, who was a stigmatist that Padre Pio appeared to the day he died and said, now it's your turn. And she mm. received the stigma of the year later on Good Friday. Mm. So I said, yeah, I would be interested in traveling with her. She was bringing about a trip of 25. And so we went down there, and I remember specifically, you know, that, I mean, I was seeing Padre Pio and the the, um, the clouds, all kinds of things were happening, the same type of miracles happening in Medjugorje, so it kind of got my attention, right? Right. And... Maria was speaking, but she was speaking in Spanish. And I was getting pretty bored because, you know, I didn't know Spanish, so I started to walk away. And she came off the stage, split the crowd, and grabbed me by the arm. As you were walking off? Yeah. <gasps> and she, she said to me, she said, I know you in perfect English. I've seen you in visions. You have the face of a priest. <gasps> And then she told me something personal, and then she looked at my mom and she said, congratulations, because my mother was praying for, you know, me to be a priest since I was a boy, you know, and I always kind of rejected that. So I had that experience, and then, you know, my senior year of college, I had this dream when I was a boy about playing professional football, which I thought was professional football. And... In college, I had this deja vu on the field. We were playing the um, Cardinals. So you had the dream when you were about eight years old. Is that correct? Eight. eight. About eight years old. And you were, you, you were in a game. I was in a game, and I had a deja vu that was so strong I didn't understand it. I could tell you what was going to happen immediately in the future, uh, you know, if we were going to score on the drive, the whole thing. It kind of I was in these 10, 12 plays and I could reverse or go forward. It was strange, right? So you were living and, it, knowing what would happen as you were living it on the football field. Right. And um, I didn't know what was happening at the time. But that night, we won the game. I was in the locker room. with I was weeping because I thought it was going crazy. We ended up back at our apartment, and we were having a little get-together. And uh, at about 3... Midnight, I said, I had enough, and I went and I grabbed my rosary and I prayed myself to sleep. At 3 o'clock in the morning, I was woken up, and I had the same dream I did when I was a boy. 
And it was the same 10 plays, or the same 10 or 12 plays that I played this afternoon. And it was so vivid and so alive, right? And then I heard God say, um, you have fulfilled your dream. And then he said, now mine, priesthood. And that was the time I, I basically said, okay, 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 uncle, I give. Mm. Okay, I'll go. I'll start working on this. So welcome back. We're with Father Michael Leitner, who is just about to tell us the moment in which he said, hey, God, you win. I've been fighting this call to the priesthood long enough. I surrender. Is that correct? Is that where we're at in your story? That's pretty much what happened. Okay. So did it take you a while to go into seminary? And was that another well, story? That- that was my senior year of college, um, so it was done. And what I did is I picked up a teaching uh, license when I went back home. I taught, uh, I substitute taught for a bunch of dis- different districts in, in high school and grade school. And then that next year is when I entered the seminary, and um, I entered in the fall. So how do you feel about being a priest now? Well, it definitely is an interesting life. It's it's so grace-filled in what you learn and what God is teaching all of us, you know, as we go through life. Um, it's, you know, you have a love for the Eucharist, and I, bet, I, I definitely have a love for Our Lady. And it seems like, you know, in my estimation, Our Lady is our general. I mean, God is sending her back to earth to tell us. Hey, repent, repent, repent. We see it in Fatima. We see it in Pita. We saw it in Lourdes and, and all of these different, you know, Cabello, Mentagoria, all these different Marian apparitions. And I think we're a little thick-headed sometimes, you know, and that information doesn't get out to people in a sense that they go, oh, my goodness, this is happening in the world today. Yeah. The Virgin Mary continues to to appear in Medjugorje today and tomorrow and the next. And it's something that if if you've never experienced, it's a very, very blessed time to go. Especially when the travel opens up, you know, in the Europe. But I heard some Americans have been to Medjugorje um, since COVID. So oh, okay. um, start, the borders are open. So you've been there 30 times. Uh, What would you say, what would you want to say to people, especially to those who just continue to point to criticisms, a lot of which are just not true. They're they're honestly fabricated, but they get repeated on the internet. Um, One, for instance, being, oh, Vishka flinched in one of the apparitions or the Blessed Mother would never appear so many times. Um, What do you do like with the first one? How would you respond to somebody? How do you respond to the people who look at you, see that your conversion happened there, see how much you love Our Lady because of there, see that your priesthood comes from there, and that you as a priest, well, at least you were a priest part of the time, have went back 30 times and have seen conversion after conversion still say it's a hoax or not real well i would tell you this story and this is the first time this is story has ever been told publicly um last time i was there with a friend um priest father rick wendell who is i think chapter two in your book and this young lady who was a tour guide came up to us and she looked at me and she goes are you father michael leitner <laughs> <laughs> Father Rick looked at me like, what the heck is going on? <laughs> and I never heard this story before. She said, oh, my goodness, i got to tell you this. And she started crying. And when I spoke, and I spoke several times at their youth event in Vladifest in, in Medjugorje, um, my conversion story, the first time went out to about 2.5 million people, 70,000 people around. And I was given my testimony of what happened there in Medjugorje, just kind of talking to the kids. 
And a young man heard it, but he was there to kind of meet um, girls. He, he didn't come for the right reason. And, um, you know, he was drinking a lot. And he was meeting girls and hitting on girls. And, and I understand, you know, I was that age once too. And uh, all of a sudden, everybody laughed. And he was wondering where everybody was. And, and he was, you know, everybody was there listening to the talk. So he actually came and heard my talk kind of passively in the crowd. And then the same thing happened that night where he went back to drinking and, and everybody was gone again. And he was wondering where everybody was. Well, everybody was at the Holy Mass. So he's so far back in the crowd. He's back by the trees where hardly anybody is. And communion time came, and Father Donko says to me, he says, Father Mike, he says, I want you to go as far out and work your, work your way in to get communion. And I said, okay. So what I didn't know is this young man, God proposed to him priesthood. What happened? And I missed that. God proposed to this young man who was drinking and going to meet girls. Uh, to become a priest. How did God do that? When he spoke to him. Oh. And basically he said to God like I did, he says, well, this other guy made you jump through hoops, so I'm going to make you jump through hoops. He says, Lord, I'll know it's you if that guy that was speaking this afternoon will come out to me and I'm the first one that he gives communion to. And everybody who's listening or viewing, Father Michael is saying, that this guy said that to God regarding Father Michael, that Father Michael had to come down, correct, and give him communion. Give him communion, and he had to be the first one that I gave communion to. Yeah. So I simply followed Father Donko's directions. I walked out as far as I could from the last person, and I went to the body of Christ, and it was this young man. So jumping back to the conversation with me and Father Rick and the tour guide, the tour guide sitting there crying. And she said, this year he was here and he gave his testimony <gasps> as a priest in Medjugorje at the youth festival. And not only him, but his best friend that was here to find girls too, oh. became a priest. So there's little miracles like that that are so inconsistent with the negative stuff of Medjugorje that that outweighs the grace that God is providing for his church so much outweighs a flinch or something that happened in the mystical that somebody's trying to interpret in the real world. You know, people that don't want to believe are not going to believe. The people that are open with their heart, God will speak to. It's interesting because people are asking for something concrete to tell them it's real. Saying, well, I saw a concrete little flinch and therefore 30 plus years of the Virgin Mary causing vocations, causing people to pray fast, read their Bible, go to confession and repent and seek a whole new way of living. A priest once told me if there's another place on earth I could take teens to and they change, I'll take them there. It's just that that's what happens to them in Medjugorje. And so mm -hmm. you, you have all of these graces and people still say, well, yeah, you've given me all this scientific evidence. These atheists have converted because they've studied the visionaries. They're clearly in ecstasy. Yeah, yeah, you talk about the fruits, but it's not about the fruits. Yeah, you talk about uh, the Vatican having established a commission and the vast majority of the cardinals and theologians who studied it said, yes, the first seven apparitions are Our Lady, and they continue to investigate the rest. Yes, the Pope opened up and said you can have diocesan pilgrimages. Yes, you have a youth festival of 80,000 plus people there. But that doesn't mean anything. Can you explain that to me? Well, I, I'm just baffled. I really am. We're, we're, we're seeing that, too, in politics today, that the truth has no bearing on how people feel about it. So they're going to go on the Internet and they're going to emote. I mean, I know that, you know, the head of the wanderer, you know, 
his wife went, all of a sudden he had this vendetta against Medjugorje because his wife changed, right? So all this negative press that was coming from that particular institution came because his life was affected, but he, all he could see was the negative, not the positive. People that think negatively are going to see negatively. Those that um, live in faith are going to see with eyes of faith. I mean, that's where it is. And the thing is, the overwhelming evidence, the scientific evidence, the scientific studies that were done to the children in ecstasy all conclude that they're somewhere else, right? Even the fact that the, the commission of the Vatican basically approved the seven first visions were because these children were threatened by death if they didn't recant. These are small children. They were threatened by what? The Death. Oh, death. And and they didn't they didn't recant. That's what the Vatican's looking at. That's a supernatural grace. And you, you say it's not about the fruits. There's more priests coming out of Medjugorje than most, you know, dioceses in the world. I mean, there's nobody with a better vocation record than Medjugorje. And they're not all Franciscans. They're coming out as diocesan priests and other orders to serve God. So for years, I know Cardinal Schoenberg from Austria said that if it wasn't for Medjugorje, his seminaries would be empty. Yeah. Now the priesthood is the key to the Catholic Church, right? You destroy the priests, you destroy the Eucharist. And the thing is, is what's God doing? What's Our Lady doing is she's giving the world priests. Yeah. She's converting them. Well, Cardinal Schoenberg from Austria, you know, made a mention and publicly said if it wasn't for Medjugorje, his seminaries would be empty. And the thing is, is what these people bring to bear is a knowledge that Mary exists, that Mary affected their lives. This is the mother of Jesus, right? Muslims all over the world are converting as well. I mean, there's some major things happening in the world, and it seems like the enemy can't stand it, and he's throwing a temper tantrum. You know what just came to mind? I think speaking to those who are who are faith filled, I can see I can see people in their minds having rebuttal toward what you just said. And hey, I'm faith filled. I believe in Akita. I believe in Fatima. I believe in La Salette. I believe in all the church approved apparitions. Do you think that there's a block against Mary appearing in their lifetime? That somehow that's a block and and somehow it's a block that it's not totally church approved which you and i know isn't going to happen until after the apparitions have ended and and there's an inv full investigation done that the church almost never approves of an apparition while it's still ongoing so we can't expect that but but they're still just waiting and i find that interesting because if that were the way the church worked then the bishops and, and the faithful and the true Catholics would have said in Fatima, don't go out to look for the miracle of the sun because it's not church approved. And yet it was the miracle of the sun and people responding to the grace that Mary was given through Fatima. And it was that was one of the conditions of asserting that it was true was the response of the faithful. So even ingrained in the way that the church seeks to authenticate or discredit an apparition is the public's the faithful's response to it so it's almost as though the people are saying you can't respond to it until it's approved but yet we need you to respond to it in order to discern whether it can be approved does that make sense it does but what you have to look at is you have to look at the greater war going on right if you look at it in an aspect of spiritual warfare, it makes a perfect sense. sense that the truth is going to be stifled and people are going to stifle the truth, right? It's like these clowns that want to change the Bible and put new phrases in it. Well, it says on the last page, if you change these words, you're destined for a very hot place, mm -hmm. right? Why do that? But they're doing it anyway, right? Why would you have, you know, a priest desecrate an altar, right? Why would you have these things? I mean, evil exists. And the thing is, is the world better get clear very quickly that there is a war going on. And it's a spiritual war. It's a, a war of principalities of darkness and the angels. And the thing is, is 
when you look at that, it makes perfect sense why Medjugorje would be, in a sense, um, stifled. And that word is not getting out. Why is that? Because Satan doesn't want people to know. No. Right? You look at it from that logic. Yeah. In a strategic thing, it's brilliant. But the thing is, is we know who wins. Christ died on the cross for everyone, right? He's going to give everyone a chance. He's going to bring his mercy. His divine mercy is important. When he comes back, when he restores heaven and earth, all of this stuff is going to be over. And, and those are the things that we have to look to as Christians, is that, yeah, it may be tough now, but there is no resurrection without the cross. Unless you're willing to suffer for the kingdom of God, unless you're willing to suffer for your friends and neighbors, your family, there's no resurrection. We're going to die in our sin. And the thing is, is Christ already did that, but yet he's calling us to do the same. Right? To turn the other cheek, to love our neighbors, to love our enemies, to pray for them. We need to be a country of prayer. The best place we can be is on our knees right now. Absolutely. What is, um, is there a message from Medjugorje that particularly touched your heart? And is there a moment where you saw a conversion in someone else when you were in Medjugorje? You mentioned one such instance, uh, but you didn't even know about it. You just handed the, the boy communion. But is there something you saw that touched your heart deeply? Boy, there's been many occasions it's hard to filter it out to just one. But uh, I would say going to Medjugorje for me has been inspirational because as soon as you see someone go to confession, and as a priest I get to hear them, and that's been one of the highlights in Medjugorje because these confessions are rock solid. They're, they're laying everything on the line. Right? And that's the kind of confessions you hear. People are really serious about shedding sin and living a life of grace. But I would say that after that, the smiles and the happiness of people just being there, after they confess their sins, after they go to Mass, receive the Eucharist, and the peace that is there, I've never felt there's only one place in the world that's ever like that. And me and my mom spent so many times there together, it's almost like home, you know? Yeah. Having your mom there with you and being on 30 trips with her. Oh my gosh. You know, it's, when I was there after she passed, you know, I, I went there and I was walking through Medjugorje and I was thinking to myself, it's like she's gonna pop her on the corner, <laughs> you know? Yeah. And just that feeling that she's so close, right? Mm -hmm. So I think, that's that's a big part of it for me is, you know, when I need to recharge my batteries and get straight in a sense of, you know, get back to serious prayer and have that spiritual retreat, I don't want to go anywhere else. Medjugorje is it for me. It's, it's a beautiful place. I just got to go to uh, the shrine of Our Lady of Guadalupe that Cardinal Burke built in La Crosse, Wisconsin. What a beautiful experience that was. Beautiful, beautiful shrine. And then you know that in Wisconsin, in Champion, Wisconsin, we have the only existing approved apparition site in the United States. Yeah. Lady of Good Help. Yeah. For those who are, are watching this, perhaps, or listening to it and thinking, gosh, I, I want to go, or I want to bring my son or daughter, I want to expose them to this great grace, but my finances or COVID or some other such reason do not allow it. What would you, what would you say to them? Or what do you think mother Mary would say to them and say from your heart? I would, I would give them the advice of book the ticket and have faith. You know, if our lady wants you there, she's going to pay for it. You know, her son's got all the money in the world. <laughs> you know, people haven't heard the infant of Prague. You know, it's a great devotion to baby Jesus, and he has a tendency to drop money in our lap anytime we need it, right? <laughs> um, we, we have to realize that God is bigger than all this. This is about salvation of souls. There's no money that can buy that. You cannot pay cash, you know, American currency for the grace of God. 
where it comes from is that willingness to discover and to to look at God and go, okay, are you real? I, I tell teenagers all the time, I said, you should ask those questions. Lord, are you real? And ask those questions because pretty soon he's going to show up. He'll reveal himself and your life will never be the same. Hmm. So of all the places you've been in the world, is Medjugorje the one where you honestly tell people to go? Like if, if someone came up to you and said, Father, I'm... I'm Catholic. I'm going to die soon. There's one place. I mean, I want, I want my last trip. Would it, would it be Medjugorje? Absolutely. It would. Absolutely. Wow. Absolutely. Um, no doubt. About it. No doubt about it. No doubt about it. It's home. It's home. It's home. It definitely is. I mean, the mother of God is appearing there. God is very close. The veil between heaven and earth is so thin. I was telling a, a, another interviewer, uh, Christine Bacon, the other day about this story where a woman, a group went up a mountain and one of the elderly ladies fell. She cracked her head and she had a scar across her face and was bleeding profusely from the thing. Everybody was in a panic. And she was a nurse, a trauma nurse. First thing she did was take her T-shirt off you know, down to her sports bra, and then put that pressure on her head. And while she was doing that, she said a prayer. She said, Lord, you know, let this not ruin our trip. You know, allow your grace to fill her. You know, allow her to heal and recover. She took the cloth off, and there was a scar there that looked like it was three months old. But it stopped bleeding just like that. That happened on the mouth. You know, I mean... So many miracles that happen. I could go on for hours and hours, hours and, and hours, hours and hours. Yeah. But the thing is, is there's nowhere else in the world that I would rather be. Well, thank you, Father. You know, you mentioned, speaking of, in Medjugorje, God reveals that he's there in the, the every day. He's there in everything that you just simply doing your duty as a priest following direction and walking to where you're to hand out the you know give the eucharist is the one of the biggest miracles of someone's life because god orchestrated you to do that for someone else and i think it's good to know that if we're open the lord is doing that to us and to others all the time it may seem like the most mundane thing we've ever done and yet it could be the biggest miracle for someone else and for us, and we don't even know it because we're simply walking in his will. And I think, my gosh, my, my dear friend Kendra was not able to do the radio show anymore, and, and you and I are on this show. It's Find Your Way Home on Radio Maria. And I was praying. I said, okay, Lord, would, would you like me to continue, and do you have a replacement? And uh, Christine Bacon had interviewed me for one of her shows and she popped in my head and I thought how wonderful that um, that there's such a person and so I called her she immediately wanted to do the show so yes uh, the the cat the thing is out of the bag Christine Bacon is going to be my next uh, radio show partner and uncannily but also not so uncanny I call Father Michael and I said, can we do this show? We'll, we'll pre-record it. We'll go on. And he said, I'm sorry. It, I, I really can't. Actually, it's better for me to do it next week because Christine Bacon has asked me to speak on her show about my conversion story involving Medjugorje. And so, and you just mentioned her and I hadn't told the audience yet that this would be the wow. next show is with Christine the Bacon. Reveal. <laughs> this is the big reveal. So thank you, Father, for revealing it before I did. Congratulations, Christine. She'll be a wonderful, wonderful partner. I'm so glad to hear that. That's that's wonderful to hear. So it just um, another thing that God places in our lives. And, and I think you might agree with me, Father, that if you're listening to this or watching this, it's not it's not really Christine Watkins. It's not just Father Michael Leitner speaking to you. Truly, it's Our Lady. And she wants, she wants your heart. She wants and, your... And, yes. and her spouse. 
Yes. You got to remember something from Mary, right? Is there's a devotion out there called the Seven Sorrows. And there was a priest in Chicago. His name was Father Peter Mary Rookie. And he was a wonderful, wonderful Servite priest, which were devoted to the Seven Sorrows of Mary. And this guy, I seen more miracles at the hands of this priest than anyone that I've ever seen before. And he was so humble and simple. But he had that devotion to Our Lady's Seven Sorrows. And you got to remember who Mary's spouse is, right? If you remember Scripture, the power of the Most High will overshadow her, right? And she was filled with the Holy Spirit. And the angel said, it's by the Holy Spirit that you'll have this child, and you'll name him Jesus. Now, that's a paraphrase. But if her spouse is the Holy Spirit, and these seven wounds are on her heart, we know the grace flowed from Jesus' wound, blood, and water. What is falling from Mary's heart in those seven wounds? If her spouse is the Holy Spirit. The grace of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit. Seven gifts of the Holy Spirit. Yeah. Outpoured to the world, right? So true charismatic, charismatics, you know, mm -hmm. people that believe in the Holy Spirit, living by the Holy Spirit, mm -hmm. usually devotion to Our Lady. Mm -hmm. And the reason is because her spouse is so intimately connected with her that that grace is poured to people that honor her because if you honor her, you honor the Son. Right. Mm -hmm. So that's the that was the power of Father Father Peter Mary Rookie as he was devoted and the Holy Spirit flowed so beautifully through him. I asked God one time after an event with Father Rookie and I said, Lord, boy, how do you work through this man so well? And he says, It's my it's my mother's sorrowful heart. Mm -hmm. And that becomes the key. And I started praying to the seven sorrows. Our Lady of the Seven Sorrows, because mm. when you offer her pain, your pain to her, she replaces that pain with the gifts. Mm. That would be the starting for any listeners who really want to live the life of the Spirit. Go to confession, start praying the Seven Sorrows. Even if you're starting off, saying Our Father, seven Hail Marys and the Glory Be, and and just pause after each Hail Mary and think about the mystery of the Seven Sorrows. And it's, it's totally beautiful, but it, it's centered on Jesus' cross and his sacrifice. So what I'll do on the YouTube version of this that we'll have on the Queen of Peace media channel on YouTube is I will give a link. I will look for a good website with the seven sorrows. And for you listeners and viewers, I will link to that so that you can begin this beautiful devotion. And, and hopefully... If, if your hearts are open and it's God's will, begin to receive an inundation of the graces and gifts that the Holy Spirit wants to give you through our Lady. Amen. And Father, speaking if, of grace and if, prayers, yes. If you don't mind, I would love to plug my YouTube channel, which Please is S S T M M P, which is stand, it's the acronym for St. Margaret Mary Parish. Um, if you go to that, if you search that, my stuff will pop right up. You can search my name. You can search St. Anthony's as well and find me. Um, but, you know, if you want to hear some homilies, I do a video mass every morning, um, usually about five times a week. I have stuff, content to put out, especially masses. So um, if you want to come and listen to the homily or, or share mass with us, please do. And I know how to get you all interested. Um if you go to his YouTube channel and do a healthy search, you'll find him in a wig. And I think that's very important. And um, so now I know you're all going to find oh, his channel. So I'll put that in the links as well. You mean, you mean this one? Yes. I wanted him to do this. Yes. <laughs> that's, my, that's my ode to Bob Ross. My first degree was in, in art, so I paint. And during the COVID crisis, I was doing something called the studio chat, which was I was doing some painting online and doing kind of a scripture study um, uh, retreat with that in mind. So uh, it's a little foolish, but it's Bob Ross. He was the first guy who painted on TV and made it popular. So uh, that was my ode. That was my thing this COVID. I think we can all say now, it's one of the most beautiful things we've ever seen. 
funny. And Father, would you uh, grace us with a blessing to close, please? Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, I ask you through the intercession of Our Lady, Queen of Peace, to reign your peace upon the world, especially the hot spots in our country, those that are struggling the most, those that are sick. Lord, we ask you to pour your holy love and peace and joy upon them through their guardian angels, Lord, to allow that network of angels to be poured that grace to pour upon us so that they can bless everyone who listens, everyone that sees our lady as mother. And Lord, we ask you through your son, our Lord Jesus Christ, that you and your glory, the father may be revealed and they may accept you as God, our father, that you created all of us, that you love all of us, bring peace to them in their mind, their heart, and their soul. And may Almighty God bless you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, Father. God bless you. Mm -hmm.